Good evening, Seoul. A big hello to you from Haji, House of the Gospel. We don't use acronyms like as much as you guys use your acronym, but we are the Haji, as some people say. Uh, man, this is so weird. I've never preached with a table before. Okay, so this is going to be my first time. So if and you can't hide anywhere. Like, what is this? Um, dear soul, I'm very glad that I have an opportunity to speak to you tonight. Uh, I was commanded to speak in English only. Для тех, кто не понял, мне дали приказ говорить по-английски только. So I will only speak in English. Uh, hopefully, that's not too big of a deal for most of you. Uh, I'm glad to be here. I'm from Fresno. And before I introduce my topic of what I'm going to talk about, I would like to introduce myself, because that's what I would like to do. Uh, especially when the people I'm seeing, most of them are for the first time. So my name is Alex Ivanov. I'm married to Ina Ivanov. And this is our family. I have one wife and I have two dogs. And uh, the, big, the big guy, his name is Hunter. And the little girl, her name is Joy. And they're both lion hunters. They're African lion hunters. You can just Google that after the church. What does that mean? Okay. That's our little family. We live in Fresno, California, not too far from here. Actually, farther than Sacramento. I was driving him here from West Sacramento. You guys, wow. You guys are far. It's like half an hour drive. My goodness. Well, anyways, that's my little family. And um, this is what I do. I am one of the pastors at House of the Gospel. Uh, it is a, a Slavic Baptist church. However, we do have an English service there as well. And I work as a teacher, as a high school teacher at Clovis West High School, one of the local schools in Fresno area. So that's who I am. I do have some relatives here. I have some little nieces and nephews who go here, and I do have a brother here. You may know him. And today I want to talk to you about the topic that is very dear to me, a topic that is very close to my passion in the church. And that topic is church on a mission. Church being on a mission. Or what does it mean to be missional? What does it mean to be a missional church? And before I start this topic, I, I would like to just say thank you to your pastor, Vadim, who invited me, you know. Uh, actually talking about school, I went to school with Vadim, your pastor. First six grades, we went to the same school. And we were enemies at the time because he went to a different class and we always competed. And, uh, you know, I texted him and I said, hey, I want to talk to you. I just wanted to talk to him about ministry. And he said, I'm out of town, but I need you to preach. So here I am. Why don't we pray real quick? I would like for us to pray and we'll start our discussion on this um, topic. Dear God, I thank you so much for the opportunity to speak here to my brothers and sisters, to everyone who is present here tonight. Lord, I ask you that you please bless the heart of every listener so that as we listen, we may hear your word. Lord, help me to speak only the truth and only what you have blessed to be spoken. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So let's read the passage of Matthew 28 verses 18 through 20. It is a very popular passage. You've probably heard it multiple times, but nevertheless, I'd like for us to read it together. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Amen. Anyone know what this passage is called? 
Anyone know the title that this passage gets oftentimes? What is this? I can't hear you. I'm a teacher, so I'm not be asking you guys questions, okay? And if you have an answer, you can just yell it out. The Great Commission. Thank you. This is known a lot of times as the Great Commission. And what we see here is the Great Commission or a command, a directive from Jesus to his disciples to do something. And the main thing he wants his disciples to do is, I want you to go and make disciples. I want you to make disciples of all nations. So the very first thing that we see here is that Jesus is commanding his disciples to do something. What's interesting about this passage and this command is that this command was not given just to the special 12 or 11 at the time because Judas was no more, right? It wasn't a great commission or a command given just to the 11. It was given to the 500 disciples who were present at the time when Jesus was speaking this. So this is not just to only some special people. This is for everyone who considers himself a disciple of God or disciple of Jesus. Jesus says, everyone should be going and making disciples of all nations. So they get together, they hear this important message, and they hear this main command that Christ gives to the believers. And the first main thing I want us to focus on is the phrase, make disciples. What was the last thing some of you guys made? Maybe even today. A phone call. Somebody made a phone call. Did anyone make a sandwich today by any chance? A few, a few of you. I love making sandwiches. I love when I have time to make sandwich. Because when I have time to make a sandwich, what kind of sandwich am I going to make? Hopefully a really good sandwich. Okay? If, you're, if, if you have five seconds to make a sandwich, what kind of sandwich are you going to make? Probably, <laughs> uh, yeah, probably just a slob of peanut butter and that's it, right? But if you have time, you have 20 minutes to make a sandwich. You take your time. You get the bread out and you choose which bread do you want. You want the white, not healthy and tasty or the black, healthy, not so tasty. Which one am I going to eat? You look for all the spreads you're going to use. You look for all the meats you want to use. You don't use veggies because you're not a vegetarian, right? And you're trying to make the best sandwich ever. But the best sandwich ever needs time. It needs care. It needs the right resources. So you are making that sandwich. A good sandwich needs attention. Jesus Christ calls us, those of us who say we are disciples of Christ, he calls us to make disciples. I know sandwich and the disciple are like, don't go to camp. Like these are bad comparisons maybe, right? But in order to make a disciple, what do you need? Just like a sandwich, you need to spend time to build this person into a disciple of Christ. You need the resources. You need patience because sometimes ketchup will fall all over the place and you will need to clean up. You need the right resources. You need the right ingredients to make a good disciple of Christ. And this is the important part that I want us to focus, that I want us to remember that a disciple is not just someone who we've invited to church. Here, you need to be baptized, repent and baptize, and that's it. If we want to make disciples, we need to spend time making them disciples. Are there any parents out here who teach their children to fish? Nobody. Two. Two dads raise their hand. How do you teach a kid to fish? You've got the little YouTube video, or you've got little instructions written out. This is how you put the bait in on the, what's that called, fishing pole. This is how you throw the fishing pole. Here you go, kiddo. Good luck. Is that how we teach people to fish? I am not a fisherman, so I wouldn't know. 
But I'm guessing that you, besides telling your kids how to fish, you take them with you, right? You take them with you, you, you sit them next to you, you don't, you don't sit fishing, right? But you're here, they're standing next to you, right? And you show them, this is how you hold the udeshka, right? <laughs> this is how you hold the fishing pole. This is how you put the bait on there. Be careful, don't get the hook into your finger, right? And this is how you, what do you call that? Do the fishing pole throwing in, right? Cast, 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 the, cast the fish. Thank you, man, you guys are good. But it, again, it needs time. It needs an example. That, that child needs uh, to, to be shown how to do certain things. Ladies, do you teach your uh, daughters to bake or cook? No? Nobody teaches their daughters to cook anymore. Thank you. One person teaches her daughter to cook. Thank you. You are our future. All right, good. All right, a second one. You'll get good husbands. Okay, good. Your daughters will. Uh, but again, it takes time. It takes energy. You don't give your daughter a set of ingredients and say, here, make the borscht. Right? Because she'll be like, what does it mean, a fistful of salt? What does it mean to, to cut the, what do you cut? What, not, uh, what do you cut? The svikla, right? The beets, thank you. Right? See, I'm, 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 I'm learning some other language right now. But it takes time. And besides time, it takes mother or a parent to show the child how it's done. And it's not only once. You got to show your child how to do something multiple times until they perfect it. And then you can be like, okay, you can get married now, right? But, and this is what te Jesus teaches us. He says, I want you believers to make disciples, not to drag them to church and sit them down and say, listen, the preacher is going to teach you. He says, I want you to go out and make disciples. I want you to spend time praying for that person. I want you to spend time reading Bible with that person. I want you to take that individual out to coffee and talk to them about their life. I want you to take that individual who maybe just now, they, they just got baptized, and you know, that person is struggling. I need you to take them out and and spend some time with them, teach them what it means to be a disciple of Christ. You who are strong believers, Christ teaches us to make others disciples. It's time, energy, ingredients, resources. Make disciples. And the second point out of this verse that I want us to really, really make sure that we, we, we know this is that all ethnicities make disciples of all nations spreading the good news of all nations. This is why tonight your worship team, which was, by the way, was an amazing worship team. Oh, my goodness. You guys are great. You guys are great. But this is why the worship team tonight sang in English. Not just for the kids who grew up in this church, but so Maybe, just maybe, if someone walks off the street, they can understand the language that is being said or this language that is being spoken and they can worship God together with the worship team. Isn't that amazing? Wouldn't it be amazing if just like random people came into the church and started praising God because they understand the language? And this is why you guys do that. And I appreciate that. And I think God appreciates that a lot. Because he loves it when we preach to all nations, to all ethnicities. We're not just men and women. We are men and women. We're not just white, Russian. We are white, black, brown, yellow, whatever. We preach to all ethnicities. Does anyone have a friend who's black? All right. See, the first few rows. These guys, you guys have friends who are, don't look like you, right? Some of them probably go to the church. Some of them probably don't go to the church. Some of them read the Bible. Some of them probably don't read the Bible. It doesn't have to be black. Some of you probably have some Hispanic friends. You probably have some Asian friends. 
wouldn't it be cool, think of your really good friend who is not Russian. Those of you who raise your hand, wouldn't it be cool if your non-Russian friend was sitting here with you? Would that be amazing or no? I, I hear a few yeses. I think it would be amazing. Once you experience that, you would want even more of your friends to be here. This is why you guys do this, and I applaud you for that. And I, and I will pray that God blesses yours, continues to bless this service. So, go make disciples of all nations. How do we do that? How do we do that? How do we accomplish this great commission? The process of accomplishing the task is not an easy process. It's not a process that happens with a flick of the finger. It's not something that you can achieve just by bringing a person to one church service and all of a sudden they change, or to one Bible study and all of a sudden they change. Or you say one prayer and that's it, they changed. It's a process. And this process take on, takes on three main points that I wanted to point out. Going, baptizing, and teaching. Going, baptizing, and teaching. Going back to verse, let's see, what was it? Verse uh, 18, um, 19, I'm sorry. Go, therefore, and make disciples, right, baptizing them and teaching them. So go, teach them and baptize them. Now when we read the original language of, the, um, of this passage, it literally says, pursue the journey. Instead of just the word go, it says pursue the journey. But go is easier for us to understand. Get on this journey. Basically meaning, as you are living, while you are on your way of living life, while you're doing this, make disciples. While you are going. So where are we going in life? What is happening to us in life? We were born, we grew up somewhat, we went to school, right? As you're going to school, make disciples. We graduated school, hopefully we graduated the school, we got a job. As you're working, make disciples. As you're working, as you're hanging out with friends, as you are uh, getting together for birthday parties, as you are going to school, make disciples. Every single day. Every single day. It seems a little bit hard. It seems a little bit intimidating because... You know, if you just come up and say to your friend, Jesus loves you, and that person never heard of Jesus, probably they're going to think you're a little bit weird. Right? They're going to be like, okay, thanks. Who's Jesus? Which Jesus, right? It's tough. It is tough, but uh, the Christ um, basically calls us to have these opportunities, to make these opportunities, no matter where we're at, no matter who we are surrounded by, we should be in the process of making disciples. And we'll get to the point of how do we do that literally. I'll give you some examples of how that's done in a few minutes. Second part of this accomplishing this task is baptizing. So as you're going, make disciples. And once they repented, you baptize them. That's the second part of the process. We baptize in the, you guys baptize people in this church, right? Yeah. I heard you guys are starting a new class on baptism, right? So we prepare people for baptism. We learn the Bible together and we eventually baptize them. It's not a tradition that the church does. Okay, those of you who are not baptized yet, it's not a tr tradition church came up with. Baptism is a unique part of Christ's command to be disciple of his to be baptized when we get baptized we become associated with Jesus Christ we become a part of the church we proclaim that I am a disciple of Christ 
when we are baptized. It is a proclamation to others that the person being baptized is a new person. And the last part is teaching. So as you're going, you're baptizing and you're teaching. Guess what? Making a disciple of Christ does not end with baptism. And you know, I, I know that a lot of, probably a lot of you experienced a similar thing, but when I was baptized, and this is what usually happens. You know, you have the six months or whatever it takes to, for you to get through baptism. You go through classes, you know, how, how to read the Bible and all that stuff. And everyone is looking at you. When are you going to mess up? Because if you mess up, you can't do what? You can't get baptized. Okay? And as soon as you mess up, you go to the members meeting, the Chlenska, right? And you're like, this guy is not worth to be baptized. And we follow the, and we watch these guys very carefully. But once I got baptized, get what, guess what happened after that? Nobody cared about me. Oh, he's baptized already. Good for him. Good Christian boy, Alex. Now go do your thing. I want each one of you to, I want to encourage each one of you, especially those of you who are older. When younger people get baptized, don't lose them out of your sight. Because real life starts after baptism. Because attacks of Satan starts harder after baptism. And you who are older, you've been through some of these things. And you come up to them and you teach them. You continue to teach those who were baptized. You continue to help them grow and continue to mold them to make them into disciples. We're continuing to teach. And this is the reason why we get together and have community groups. This is why we get together with our friends and read Bible. This is why we encourage every believer to have some sort of a friend who can walk the spiritual life with them. This is why I encourage each one of you to find a strong Christian friend who can pray for you, who can walk with you, who you can share your struggles with. Because a life with Christ is not a life that it should be walked alone. A life with Christ is walked in a community with the support of other believers. Teaching Christ's command is very important without, beyond just being baptized, beyond just an individual being repented. You know, for a long time, to evangelize or to make disciples has been something that as believers we did not really want to do. Or we, we're, kind of, we're, we're kind of hesitant to do that. Like, you know, well, am I really supposed to tell them Jesus loves them? What if he finds out that I'm Christian, right? What if she finds out that I'm Christian? I can't date her now because I'm a Christian and she is not, or vice versa, right? And you're like, I'm not going to tell him that I go to church. I'm shy. Anyone shy to tell people about Jesus? Don't be lying. Oh, everyone, Okay. All right, you know, uh, well, I got a confession to make. There are multiple moments in my life when I'm shy that I'm a believer. There are multiple times in my life, has been and is and probably will be, when I am not comfortable saying, I'm a Christian. I love Jesus. And I'm sure that many of you experience similar things. But I think a reason for that, the reason why we feel guilty sometimes or why we feel like we are not why we're not courageous enough to share Jesus or to share the gospel. The reason for that is because oftentimes we think that is, it is our job to prove to someone that there is God, that there is Jesus. And that is the mistake we make. It is not my job to prove to someone that there is God. It is not our job to prove to someone that Jesus died for us. He did. He did die for us. There is God. God does exist. We believe in that. But we do not persuade people. We simply 
witness to people. And this is the second part of my sermon that I really wanted us to focus on, is that our job is not to persuade people. Our job is to be witnesses. A passage I want to share with you is Acts 1.8, the New Testament concept of witness. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, Orangeville, Fresno, Sacramento, right? Everywhere. Check this out. It doesn't say you will be people who will persuade others in believing me. You will be those who preach to others about me. You will be those who um, force others to be Christian. You will be who? You will be my witnesses. And this verse is not a command. This verse is a prediction. As a believer, as a disciple of Christ, I have no choice. Because when I receive the Holy Spirit, automatically I become a witness. Automatically. And guess what? You can be a good witness or you can be a bad witness. But you will be a witness. When you repent and receive Christ, the Holy Spirit comes down to, uh, into you and makes you into a witness of Christ. You have no choice. This is what's going to happen to you. You will either be a good witness or a bad witness, but never not a witness. And it is something that we have to do. It's not something, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It's not something that we have to do. It is something that we are, okay? To be a witness of Christ is not a command. It is what the disciple of Christ is. And being a witness is not something that we have to do. It is something that we are. Some of you probably, you know, if you know my parents or you know my brother, you probably saw me before the guy even said who is going to be up here, right? The pastor announced me and things like that. And you were thinking, huh, I think this guy is a Ivanov. This is, this is something similar right here. When we, when we receive Christ, we become witnesses. And people look at us and they say, I think this guy is a Christian. I think this girl is a Christian. Because there is something about us that makes us witnesses automatically. It's sort of like when we're walking around and we have that last name, right? Oh, that's a Tofen right there. I know it's a Tofen. Oh, there's the Ivanov. I know that's an Ivanov because of the way he looks or she looks or he, way he acts or she acts. All right? What other last names do you have here? That's Dashkevich right there. I know that he definitely looks like a Dashkevich, right? Because he belongs to that family, he, in a sense, his appearance is a witness to who he is. In a similar way, we, when we receive Christ, we become witnesses of Christ. So here's a visual I want to propose to you. This is a visual that I stole from one of the books by a Rev Reverend Allison Trite, or Trites. But here's a visual I want to propose to you, and hopefully this will help each one of you to have more strength, to have less shyness, less embarrassment, less of hesitation to be a witness. Any, anyone over here familiar with a courtroom? No one been, been to a courtroom before? You guys are liars, traffic tickets, you know. Okay, thank you, there we go. All right, some of you been to courtroom. Anyone seen a courtroom on TV? Okay, like every other TV show today has a courtroom, okay, because it's all about law and being, you know, legal and things like that. Here's a little picture I want to show you. Hopefully you can see this. 
So here's what a courtroom looks like usually. You have a table where the prosecution sits. That's the people who accuse someone of doing something. You have a pa paper. Uh, you have a table where defense sits. And defense, they protect or they defend the person that is being accused of something. You have an attorney here who is prosecuting. Okay, and I'm actually going to change this to just an attorney. Okay, this is going to be our defense attorney. You have the judge, and you have the jury. Who are the jury? What are the jury doing? What's the job of the jury? Any jury duty people? Been to jury duty? What are, what are you supposed to do as a jury? You're supposed to figure out, is the person who is being prosecuted guilty or not guilty, right? You have to decide that together. And there's a little spot right here for a witness. Witness stand. Anyone catch where I'm going with this? All right. We already heard the word witness multiple times, right? So here's what I want to propose, and I want you, to guys, want you guys to keep in mind. So right here at the defense table, we have Jesus sitting. Just imagine Jesus is sitting there, and Jesus is being on the defense because people are accusing him of call, or of of like blasphemy, people are accusing him that he never lived, people are not believing that he's God, so he's at the defense table. Over here you have a group of juries, these are non-believers, these are people who don't believe in Jesus Christ, and they have to make a decision, is Jesus Christ really who he is? The attorney in this case is the Holy Spirit. And what is the job of an attorney? Anyone? What is the job of an attorney? Any future attorneys? An attorney argues. An attorney argues for one side or the other. In this case, the Holy Spirit argues on whose behalf? On Jesus' behalf. The Holy Spirit is the one who does the job of proving that Jesus is son of God, that Jesus is the savior for the people. Here you have the accuser. Anyone know who the accuser is who accuses Jesus of being not Jesus? The Bible says Satan is the accuser, and he looks for moments when to accuse Christians of wrongdoing or Christians of messing up. Okay? Holy Spirit, the Bible tells us the Holy Spirit is an advocate who speaks on our behalf. Okay, and the last part that I want us to mention here is we have a witness. And who are the witnesses? Christians. Believers are witnesses. And if you're, any, if you're just familiar with just a little bit of the courtroom situation... What is the job of witnesses? To say, to kind of, to say what they've witnessed, right? <laughs> to say what they saw, right? They only answer questions. Did you see the black car get away? Did you see the guy stand there with a gun? Did you really, what, what happened next? So witnesses simply say what they've seen, what they've heard, what they felt, what they experienced, what their story is. And so our goal as Christians, as believers, when we are making disciples, is to say to those who do not believe in Jesus, what I know, what I've seen, what I've heard, what I've experienced, what I've, felt, what I've felt, or what I feel. You know, when I, when I started believing in Jesus Christ, I, I've, I, I started having this peace in my life. This is what I started feeling. You know, when I began to follow Jesus Christ, I, I realized that I stopped arguing as much. You know, when we took our family to church, after a few times of attending church and listening to God speak to us, 
Our family life changed and we stopped fighting as much. You know, I've seen people change lives. You know, I've seen people who come to church, they receive Christ and they stop drinking and they stop smoking and they stop swearing and they stop doing all these things. I've seen it with my eyes. My job is not to say, Yes, God does exist. There are people who are professionals at that. We call them apologists, right? And we'll give that to them. But that's like 0.0005% of Christian population. Most of us, we are witnesses. All of us are witnesses. And we have each, of, each one of us has a way that we can witness to others without proving something. You know why? Because who has already proved everything? Jesus has proved everything already. He already died on the cross. He doesn't need our, our voices to defend him. He's got the Holy Spirit who is our advocate. You know, he, he did what he did. And he doesn't need our, you know, uh, our, this, this uh, eager, you know, I'm going to fight you if you don't believe in Jesus kind of thing, attitude. All he wants us to do is to tell others, this is why I believe in Jesus. This is why my life is different as a follower of Jesus. This is how my life changed. This is what I've seen. This is what I've heard. This is what I've felt. And so now when we put two, the two together, when we're going in our lives, we're going and we go to school. We don't even have to say anything to be a witness. If people see our character is different from others, if they see that we are honest, that we don't lie, if they see that we don't swear, that we don't use foul language, if they see that you know we do our homework, right, kiddos? If they see, kiddos, right, these college students are like, oh shoot. Uh, if they see that we are, that we have integrity, that we are fair, that we, that we have some type of different love towards people, that will be a witness to them. Same thing with our families. You know, some of us, we have family members who are non-believers. And oftentimes, we have a wrong approach of, you have to go to church or you will go to hell. Right? Because bad people go to hell. And then we live like we're not even Christian. And guess what? Their job is to hear what this guy is saying to them, how the Holy Spirit is speaking to them, and to see if these witnesses actually go along with what the Holy Spirit is saying. They, they're putting the two together. And if our life right here does not reflect what this guy is saying, then they might come up with a wrong conclusion for their, personal's life, for their personal lives. So let us remember that it is the attorney's job, the Holy Spirit's job to persuade the world of God's existence of Christ's sacrifice, of salvation, of the need for salvation, of the fact that they're sinners, and let us be the witnesses that he wants us to be. You know, the second mistake we usually make, the first mistake is we take on the role of the Holy Spirit oftentimes. And we think that it's our job to prove something. The second mistake that we often make is that we say, you know what? I'm not a missionary. You guys have missionaries in the church that you support outside? Yeah. Uh, is Ilya one of them? Because somebody asked me about Ilya, no? Well, you know Ilya doesn't look right because we support him. Some of you know. But, you know, you're missionaries. And you're like, I'm not a missionary like that person. Let them do this. Let the pastor teach people how to be disciples. Um, let the worship team do that. Let the choir do that. You know what, let group leaders do that. Youth leader, let the deacons do that. I'm not a missionary. And that's the second mistake we make. 
We take the responsibility of being a witness and we give it away to somebody else. But guess what? No matter what you do with that, you're still a witness. And the only difference can be, are you a good witness or are you a weak witness? Let's say that. Let's not use the word bad. Are you a strong witness or are you a weak witness? You know, 2 Corinthians, Paul says, 520, Paul says, we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. And one thing I want us to remember is that besides being witnesses, besides having this, all this knowledge of how to be a good witness, I think it will help us to remember that Christ has promised us something so that we could be good witness, so that we could be a, good, a strong witness. Here's the, 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 from the same passage of Matthew chapter 28. Here's what Jesus says before he actually sends disciples onto the mission. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to Christ. He has all the authority. And as disciples of Christ, we get to be under that authority. The second, the other verse I wanted to share is that at the end there, verse 20. And be sure of this, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus' presence his authority, his strength and his power should be an encouragement to us that it doesn't matter what people say about me if I tell them I'm a Christian. It doesn't matter what people say to me when I tell them that I love them. It doesn't matter when I, what people tell me when I don't do some of the things they do. It doesn't matter because I've got the power of Jesus. Because I have got the promise from Jesus that he is always with me. Jesus' presence and his authority should be an encouragement to us and should give us joy that what we are doing is the right thing. What we are doing is going to be successful. And sometimes we give up after, the first, after one prayer. Sometimes we give up after first invitation to come to some event. Jesus doesn't want us to give up on that. He wants us to continue to be witnesses for, for him. So here's how I want to end this. Where are you in this courtroom? Where are you located in this courtroom? Are you researching a bunch of videos on YouTube to prove someone wrong? And taking the power, the taking the responsibility of the Holy Spirit to try to prove someone that, to someone that God is real? Or are you in a witness stand and what is your witness like? If you are in the witness stand, what type of a witness are you? Maybe you need to show better character in life. I don't know, whatever it is. Maybe you need to show more spirit, more fruit of the spirit, like patience and love to others. Maybe you've failed to pray for someone who you know is not a believer and you really want them to be the believer. Maybe, you know, you've, you've, you've been struggling in some areas and people don't really believe you as a witness. Maybe there's something personally you need to change to be a better witness. Maybe I need, you know, maybe I need to invite someone for a cup of coffee. You know, I've never, I've, I haven't been such a, such, a, such a witness, but, you know, if I just invite them for a cup of coffee, we have a conversation, and maybe, just maybe, the Holy Spirit will speak to that individual and speak to me, and we can come to the topic of discussing the Bible. Maybe, you know, next time I have a birthday party, maybe I'll invite that one coworker that I know is not a Christian, 
but I want him to be a Christian. And at this birthday party, we're going to play games. We're going to pray. We're going to sing. And this guy or this girl, they're going to be like, whoa, what are you singing about? You know, maybe just that little tiny opportunity. Who knows? Maybe their presence in our house, them being in our house, will be a good thing for them. Maybe someone just needs a prayer. And that is my part of being a witness. So it's just some things to think about. What can I do better to be a better witness, to be a stronger witness, to be someone who simply opens my life for those who are not believers and tells them this is why I believe. But I think there are some people in this room who are in the jury box. And the people in the jury box, they're, they're not sure. Sometimes maybe you, you come to this church and you're like, I know I've been hearing this preaching for a while. And there's some preaching I understand, some preaching I don't understand. And my parents have been telling me, you need to be baptized. And I'm like, I don't even know what it means. Maybe you're in that jury box and you're like, do I believe that? Do I not believe that? I want to I tell you that, you know, Jesus Christ was the first witness to show God's love for us. He came down to this earth. He, 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 um, he, he had all these miracles that he did. He, um, he loved on people. He, uh, he spoke to the people. He taught people. And if you just read about his life, you're going to find out that this was not just a regular guy. This was a real man. Okay? And maybe, maybe you need to ask your parents or your friend or your spouse or your, you know, someone around you, why do you believe? You know, if you are in that jury box and you haven't decided, come home and ask somebody who has decided, why is it that you believe? Tell me. I just want to hear so that I don't have to be pressured into believing. I don't have to be made to believe. I want to hear your real life story. Parents, share with your children, how did you come to know Jesus? Share with them why you became a Christian. What is it that made you want to believe in Jesus besides your parents? There has to be something special. So, if you're in the jury box and you've been listening to this and you've been trying to make a decision, I want to invite you to, to uh, really begin to research in your heart, what is God speaking to me? What is the Holy Spirit saying to me? And you know what? If you're in the jury box and you're ready to rule in favor of receiving Christ, in favor of saying, yes, Jesus is real, you can pray tonight to Christ. You can pray tonight to God and say, Forgive me my sins. I want to be faithful to you. I want to be your disciple. And if you'd like to do that, you can do that during the prayer that we're going to have after this, this message. Um, but that's, that's all I have to share with you. And I, I hope that for many of you this was encouraging. And I hope that when you leave this building, you can go out there and be witnesses anywhere where you're at. Amen.